The essence of the one thing is the Pareto's principle. As a business person, I own multiple businesses. I have a job, a W-2 job with Gary Keller. We have a complex life, but I also know that if you keep things simple, you can operate there for a long time. If you allow your life to get complicated, things go off the rails very quickly. And so whenever we're instituting a new system, or whenever we're trying to make a new move, I always like simplify, 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 simplify. This is your real estate syndication show. I'm your host, Whitney Sewell. I have a, a very exciting guest for you today. I really enjoyed this conversation and interview. Learned so much. Uh, it was just pushed personally in a number of ways. And I know you will be as well. His name is Jay Papazan. And he's a VP of strategic content for Keller Williams Realty International, the world's largest real estate company. Uh, he's co-founded a, a number of of things with Gary Keller. He's He lives in Austin, Texas. Recent work with Gary Keller uh, on The One Thing. This book has sold, uh, I think, 3.4 million copies. It's been translated into 41 different languages worldwide. Uh, they have really scaled this and done an amazing job. It is a very powerful book. I hope that you have read it or are ordering it as we speak, or by the time you get done listening to this interview, uh, Jay lays out a number of things around the one thing and the importance of the just the focus, right, of the one thing over a long period of time and how he's seen that happen, even how they have scaled and still been focused you know, on one thing and how that has helped him so much. He goes into a number of aspects, even at the end, we, we're talking about the faith, family, business, how he's still been focused there as well after scaling such a large business. Jay, I'm honored to have you on the show. Now you are going to bring just a wealth of knowledge and influence to our listeners that's going to help them to focus on the one thing. I mean, I'm looking forward to this conversation. Uh, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, I love what you've shared about not only what you do and where you came from, but you also have a mission in life. You're helping the world and making it, leaving it a better place than you found it. I appreciate the kind words, Jay. Um, uh, it's It's been shaped by lots of uh, many great mentors, including people like yourself. And so I, I'm honored to to get to have you on and, uh, and let's dive in. Uh, Jay, you know, you have, uh, your, your background's taken a number of turns, right? But over the last number of years, you've been very focused and, and, and that's led up to almost uh, having a path to helping lots of people be very focused on the one thing, right? Uh, but before we get to that, man, you know, Jay, uh, you know, let's back up a little bit. I know you were in Memphis, you were in Paris, you were, you know, different places studying, elaborate a little bit on that path, that time, uh, maybe you're learning to get to, uh, as we're going to build up to the one thing. So I grew up in Memphis, Tennessee, and I kind of look at my life as two chapters. There's the part of my life where I was very entrepreneurial, and then the last half of my life is almost literally a half after I married my wife and took on, uh, started my partnership with Gary Keller, the founder of Keller Williams. I, I kind of think of that phase as being more purposeful. And the through line, right, for all the little weird things that I've done, if you're watching behind me is books. Um, I was always been a reader. I was very quiet and shy. I'm very introverted. Most people don't know that because I give a lot of corporate keynotes and things, but that's just a skill you acquire if your number one value, which mine is, is impact. I want to leave an impact. I'm very clear about that. But uh, yeah, I thought I was going to know a little bit about everything. I really wanted to be a jack of all trades. Uh, I idolized Sherlock Holmes a fictional character who seemed to know everything about everything, right? I uh, had two majors, two minors in college. I am a lifelong learner. And then somewhere around 30 years old, when I moved to Texas uh, after marrying my wife and we left New York City, um, I met Gary Keller. And he lives a life of purpose and focus. And he's also an entrepreneur. Don't get me wrong. We have shiny object syndrome around here too, but I got to witness firsthand what it looks like to truly apply yourself to something, give it disproportionate focus and energy over long periods of time and what shows up. Um, I shared with you when I joined Keller Williams, uh, nobody had heard of it. It was Keller Who. 
Um, there were 6,700 agents and I was the 27th employee, not overall, there might've been another 15 that had come and gone, but there were only 27 people at headquarters. And today we've got, you know, over 175,000 in 52 countries. So I've gotten to see what happens when you identify your one thing and you just nail your foot to the pedal for a long period of time. Um, and the growth and the impact you can have. So that's the short elevator pitch on kind of my life. And I've been an editor. I've written books. I've edited books. The books I've edited and written um, are approaching, I don't know, 9 million copies. Um, so I've had good fortune to work on many books that have had a big impact. And that's make, that makes me very happy. I love a letter from a reader. Uh, my all-time favorite for the one thing, guy heard me speak and he said, because I listen to you, I've started watch, walking my children to school, and that has made all the difference. You never know what the little thing is that you need to focus on that unlocks your life. He found a way to find his one thing, right? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. He wanted to have a big life in business, but he did not want to have the regrets of not being a great father. And he found a way to align those dominoes is the language we use, lining up your dominoes. Line mm. them up just right. What happens when you knock over the first one, Whitney? They all fall down. The trick is how can we line them up so that we get multiples of results for every action? Love how you talk about you witnessed what happens when you focus on uh, one thing long enough, right? Hyper-focused and, you know, maybe speak to, uh, I know we're going to jump into this because I want to talk about uh, the process of living your one thing. And maybe we, we just start there. Sure. Uh, and, you know, uh, man, uh, walk us through a little bit. Those who haven't heard of maybe the one thing, I would, I would imagine a lot of the listeners have. Uh, but just in case they haven't, give us a high level maybe of what that looks like, what we're talking about here. And then let's dive in on just a process behind living your one thing. So we can be like that gentleman, right? We find, We figure out, hey, what is that one thing and figure out how to focus on it. Sure. Great question. And thank you for it. I uh, I think that we usually characterize it as a simple process, but not easy, like a lot of things in life. Um, as a business person, I own multiple businesses. I have a job, a W-2 job with Gary Keller. We have a complex life. But I also know that if you keep things simple, you can operate there for a long time. If you allow your life to get complicated, things go off the rails very quickly. And so whenever we're instituting a new system, whenever we're trying to make a new move, I always like simplify, 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 simplify. The essence of the one thing is the Pareto's principle. And if your listeners have read many business books, they bump into it. Sometimes some people call it the 80-20. And it's this idea. And I kind of think of it like gravity. It's hard for, I mean, scientists to explain exactly how gravity works, but nobody doubts it, right? I see that it's impact in the world. I am not going to step off of a tall building without a parachute or a rope, right? Because I know what gravity does and I see it. I think the 80-20 is like the law of gravity, but for productivity. And that means there is a minority of what I will do that will give me the majority of the results I seek. Very scarily, it often comes out to 20%, roughly one-fifth of what we actually do has this massive impact on our life. And identifying it and then focusing on it is the core of the one thing. We could have called the book Focus, but then it wouldn't have sold very many copies. Because who wants to read a book about focus? Sounds boring. But the one thing, people lean in and go, BS on that. Nobody has one thing. What is it, right? At least to get some intrigue. So the heart of the book, it would have been the first thing if people would have believed us, is a, I think, a simple question, even though it's long. We call it the focusing question. What's the one thing I can do such that by doing it, everything else will be easier or unnecessary? The quality of our answers is always determined by the quality of the question. And that is a great question. Little long, a lot of people say, what's my one thing? The full version is what's the one thing I can do such that by doing it, everything else becomes easier or unnecessary. You're asking for the biggest lever in your life currently that you can pull to make the outcome you want happen. What's the one thing for my marriage, for my health, right? For my business, for my productivity, 
you can apply this principle anywhere you want. That's the beauty of it. So you ask the question, and I'll tell you, when we were writing the book, I was like, Gary, what if people don't know their answers? And we wrote a little section about finding your answer. But in my experience, 99.9% of people, if they just stop and think about it, they already know the answer and they probably feel a little guilty for avoiding it, right? There's that saying that we hear all the time. It's kind of trite, but the success you're looking for is in the work you're avoiding. Mm -hmm. And often the thing that's the hard thing or the important thing is the thing that we defer for later. And the reason we do it is because we know the stakes are high, not because we don't think it's important, but what happens if I fail at that thing? Mm -hmm. And so we do all of this, shadow work. There's a great book called Going Pro by Stephen Pressfield. If you haven't read it, it will uh it will inc- you will feel incriminated. You will feel seen, but he calls it shadow work. He wanted to be an author. And so he had a typewriter, he rolled around the country, he had life experiences, he smoked cigarettes and drank whiskey, and he said that's the shadow work of being a writer. We see writers that behave this way, but that's not the work. The work is sitting down at the keyboard and writing. So how do we avoid the shadow work to do the real work to get our outcomes? And I'm going to, I mean, I'm simplifying it as fast as I can. It's a 240 page book. It ain't that long, but you identify your one thing. It has to be an activity, not an outcome. If my one thing is to reduce my stress for my health, great. Now what's the activity you're going to do to lower your stress? Is it get more sleep? Is it exercise? Is it meditate? You can find your answer. Now you have it, you time block it. And people have been talking about time blocking one way or another since the 70s. I think that we gave people a better framework for understanding it. It's just making an appointment with yourself to do your most important work. It's crazy. There's research that backs it up. You put that appointment on the calendar with no one but yourself. At this time, at this place, I'm going to exercise for one hour. You're about three times more likely to actually do it. Just let that sink in. Knowing you should do it, you got about a 35% chance. It goes above 90 when all you do is the simple step of blocking it on your calendar. I don't know about you. I've turned off most of my alerts on my calendar, on my phone. I'm holding up my phone for the YouTube crowd. (laughs) The 15 minutes before your next appointment, what happens? A little notice comes up and kind of warns you in 15 minutes, you need to shift your focus. It's crazy, but our devices actually could, instead of being a distraction, can actually be our cue to move to the thing that we really need to do. And I've found it to be very effective. I also, I mean, we could go down the rabbit hole of turn off all your social notifications. Don't get notifications for for emails, that sort of thing, because those are distractions. But your calendar, living your calendar is the essence of it. Figure out the things that you need to do to find your success, put them on your calendar, and then let your calendar be your boss. I'm going to shut up because I can I can just no, keep going. But let's I unpack you... that for your listeners yeah. if I've missed something. No, th- this is really good. Uh, avoiding the shadow work. and I mean, the man, the, the success you're hoping for is the thing you're, things you're avoiding, right? Uh, I, I, yeah, I love the focus question as well. And I, I wanted you to be able to elaborate on that just just a bit, uh, because, you know, I'm sure you sure. have some that say, well, I don't know what it is, Jay, or, I, you know, I've got a couple of things that seem so important, right? Or I can't, I mean, I, I have, okay, Jay, I've narrowed it down to these three things, and I can't let any of those things go yeah. or not happen or, you know, help yeah. us to figure that out. Sure, sure. I mean, uh, when we first uh, shared this book at the the Book Expo in New York, all of these book buyers from Amazon, Barnes and Noble, you name it, they like some of them literally laughed. Like, what are you talking about? Nobody's got gets to do one thing. And that's probably the biggest misconception is that you only focus on one thing. The reality is our brains are set up, even though we don't always act like it. We can only focus, truly focus on one thing at a time. So the key here is when you have that appointment with yourself, do you know what the one thing is that you need to focus on for that period of time? You can then shift your focus to other areas of your life. I find that the biggest changes happen when you go all in. 
that that appointment becomes the center of your calendar. And I'll I'll give you an example. Um, Part of my transformation from entrepreneurial to purposeful, I was 29, 28, and my roommate, I was right, I just met my wife, but we hadn't gotten engaged yet. She didn't smoke. And back then I was a smoker. I'd lived in Paris. I rolled cigarettes. I thought it was really cool. And he's like, you want to quit smoking? I want you to quit smoking because he had a very sensitive nose. And he's like, we're going to run a marathon and that's how you're going to do it. And I was like, sure. And we signed up for the New York marathon. And I thought the odds were very low that I would actually get picked and get a bib. But he knew a trick. And we went to this park at this time. And you were guaranteed to get one. He set me up. And I had three months to train for the New York marathon. And I played soccer. I was a decent athlete. But I'd never probably run more than three miles at a time. So in three months, how do you go from never having run more than about three miles to 26.2? I clipped out. It was about the size of an index card. It was runner's world. It was a three-month running plan. Day one, you run a mile. The next day, you run 1.25. The next day, you run a mile. Then you run 1.5. And then on the weekend, you might run three, and then you take a day off. And it was this tiny, gradual build. But to train for the New York Marathon, and I was working at HarperCollins, Like I had to organize my life to get those runs in, especially when I would started running longer times. Like how do I find time to run for two hours this Saturday? How do I find time to run for an hour every day in New York City? And I would have to talk to my boss. And I was like, hey, I've got to leave the office at four so I can run around the reservoir before it's so dark I get mugged. And that thing, doing the marathon for a period of months kind of shaped my life. It shaped how I ate. It shaped how I slept. I did lots of other things. We published like three books in that period of time. But that was the focus. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah, no doubt about it. Uh, yeah. No doubt. And you you had to say no to other things, right? To be able to yeah. say yes to that. I, I said yeah. no to cigarettes. Thank God. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm much healthier today because of it. I said no to drinking. I said no to eating a lot of fatty foods because my I, I dropped. I was 185 pounds. I'm 6'3 by the time I got to the marathon. And my wife told me, he's like, you were eating so little. Like we'd go out to eat and she's a gourmand and we love food. She's like, I'm not sure I can date someone who's twice as big as me as me and eats less. But my body was like, you're a Clydesdale. That's not going to work for 26.2 miles. You need to be a Philly. Like you need to slim down. And I was like, wasn't even conscious of it but it starts to shape your life consciously and unconsciously. Um, I'll tell you one more story to unpack this. Gary would work with our number one franchise, our number one agent. He would spend two days every month and he still does it. Get on the phone with them, does coaching calls. Do you have a coach, Whitney? I have many mentors. I'm always looking for the next level mentor. That's right. Well, a mentor is someone who gives you advice. A coach is someone who holds you accountable, just to distinguish. I've had coaches for the last 15 years. And the coach at the end of a call says, great, so what are you committing to between now and the next call? Whether it's biweekly, monthly, whatever your rhythm is weekly, you make your commitments. And their job the next week is to ask you, did you do the things you said you would do? And Gary's working with the top real estate people in the world. And he was so frustrated because they would list out four or five things and they would almost never do the most important thing. And it was out of frustration that this question, the focusing question was born. Be like, Whitney, if you only do three things this week and you would do two, but not the number one. And finally, in frustration, he said, if you can only do one thing this week to move the ball forward, what is it going to be? And here's the magic. When people did the one thing, they almost always did all the other stuff. It's not to the exclusion of, it's where you start. And that's, that's amazing. Like it's the number one momentum generator in that area. And you already knocked it out. Like I was sharing with you before we got on the call, like we work out with a trainer several times a week. Today, we had a really hard workout. We rode 5,300 meters for my wife's 53rd birthday. And I'm jelly. But I can tell you, I also feel pretty darn righteous from a health standpoint, because I know I did the number one thing that I needed to do. Now, I might have a cheeseburger for lunch and splurge, but I also burned about 800 calories this morning. 
and I probably earned at least half of that cheeseburger. I know that food will just demolish a workout every day, but you know what I mean? So you narrow it down to that first domino and that starts the chain. I know that you and Gary have, have worked, I mean, uh, just so hard on focusing on this one thing, right? But you yeah. all have scaled as you, as you talked about early on, you know, what from you were the 20 something, seventh, eighth employees, you know, yeah. to now what 180,000 approximately, you know, all over the world, 50 some countries. So, you know, I, I can relate to, you know, trying to scale, right. And you're spinning all these plates, you're running in all these different directions. And uh, there's a number of team members that are counting on me or other people, right. To do lots of different things. So speak to, uh, you know, and, what, and I want us to get to how you've scaled and still been focused on the one thing, uh, but also talk about the team members who are, they, like, how are you shifting their perspective on what you are doing or the people under you, right? Your assistant, your people that are, oh, wait a minute, I know Whitney's accountable for this. He's doing this. He's doing this over here. And then and then I just say, oh, wait a minute, I'm just going to do this thing right here. Yeah. Okay. That's a great question. So I uh, we have a thing called a one-page business plan. We call it a GPS. Can't trademark it because there's another big one out there, but I like the play on words and it stands for goals, priorities and either strategies or steps, depending on the context. And the idea is that whatever your goals are for the year in your business, it's for big things like running a marathon. I'm not gonna do my GPS for what movie to pick tonight. It's something that's got a lot of moving parts. And if you have a staff, it's really helpful. You identify what's our one goal. What's the one leading indicator of our success? In most service and product businesses, the number one activity you always have to do is lead generate. Think about investment real estate. If you have more deal flow, you will get better deals. If you have better deals, you don't have trouble attracting money. Money follows good deals wherever they can be found. Your one thing is to find the best out there. As a realtor, you want to have listings, right? That is the inventory of our industry. So every industry tends to have a very obvious one thing that a lot of times people avoid. So you figure out your one goal. I like for businesses a profit goal because that's why we're in business. I know that some people are trying to IPO and it might be a revenue number because they have to hit a multiple. I get it. Now you ask the question, let's just say I'm a solo practitioner. My goal this year is to net $100,000. I've done the math. What's my number one priority to make that happen? If I could do nothing else, what would I focus on to make that happen? I'll tell you, the answer is usually lead generation. But you write that in. Great. If I do that one thing well, I'm really likely to hit that number. Great. I've got another chit to play. If that thing is going well and I can do another one, what would be my second priority to make that happen? And then you go down there for a giant company like Keller Williams with all the moving parts and all the divisions. Sometimes we might have seven, 10 priorities in a year, right? We have someone building software and that's really critical for the next year. Like bigger they are and the bigger the team, but you've got to be clear what's the number one because we can't say that we did 14 and 15 and therefore we're successful. No, we've got to win at number one. So Second layer, you got your goal, you got your priorities. For a solo practitioner, if they have more than four, I think they're complicating things. I make the people that report to me, the business owners, the CEOs that report to me in my businesses, it's got to fit on one page and it can't be smaller than 12 point type. They can't cheat. Can't be a spreadsheet with little things that open up. No, get really, really clear about what matters and then move forward. Now, under that priority, you could have five strategies or five steps. Like in our one thing business, we launched a coaching arm last year and I brought on my coach to be our head coach. And I just said, I don't like the idea that we've got dozens of coaches out there now coaching to this book and they're 1099s, but every client's experience is gonna be different. I wanted one of our goals for this year to build our coaches curriculum so that for the first three to six months, depending on where someone started, it would be very predictable the gateways they would pass through. There's not a lot of strategies. My strategy was to hire Jordan to do it and have his team work with me to build out the curriculum. So it was steps. First step is this, set, right? 
some things like my wife's business is, is she's got a very big um, residential real estate team. Her number one goal is how many listings she's going to carry. And so how many open houses will we do? There's strategies now. How often are we going to talk to our past clients in order to get that list? Like you go through the top reasons and you start with your number one, just like before. If I can only do one strategy, what is it going to be? And you build out your plan. Now on the team, you would get to assign by who, by when to each priority or strategy, depending on how big your organization is. Now I've got accountability. So your priority, Whitney, is to identify X number of deals a month for us to potentially acquire. And out of those, we believe the quality will be found, found, right? You have your criteria. Now you get your strategies, but I've got your name and I've got the cadence of accountability attached to it at the beginning of the year. Does that all make sense? We call it the GPS, one page business plan. It does. I love the the desire to simplify, right? I, I mean, yeah. and just be able to have it on one sheet. I think that's helpful for the whole team for, in well, a big way. You talk about getting everybody on the same page. This is literally, literally. how to do it, right? Now, everything we're going to do, I can put on the wall. I can glance at it. It's not, it's not like getting a loan. I'm not going to a commercial bank and I've got a 70-page business plan. That's a whole different kind of business plan. This is a action plan, right? This is our focus plan. And I'll tell you, sometimes the priorities or strategies might have their own GPS in a really, really big organization, right? That's how it kind of works out. I've got my notebook here. We're not going to go through the show and tell. Each individual player has what we call as a 411. And we have their annual goals that are assigned to them at the top. I encourage them as an employer to put their personal goals. I would love to hold them accountable to their personal goals as well. I want to run a marathon. I want to climb you know, a mountain. I want to do whatever it is. I want to be a great parent. I can't ask those things legally of my employees, but if they volunteer it, now I have visibility into what's not or is happening in their life. Because I'll tell you, you can be a great employer, but if their personal life ain't happening, they won't stay. So personal and professional goals, two columns. You have your annual goal. And each month, that's the next line, is based on my annual goal, what is my one thing this month to make that happen? Then based on my monthly goal, you have on average four weeks, right? There's the four, one, one four weeks in each month for one year. What am I going to accomplish this week to hit my monthly target? We call that goal setting to the now. We're starting with the end and we're working backwards to make it more bite-sized. And you get really good with that muscle. In the beginning, it's really hard. But like, what is the weekly portion to make that monthly goal happen? What is the monthly portion to make my annual goal? And you get to adjust over time. But my stand-ups with my staff are very simple. They send me their 411. They have to every single week, the ones that report to me, show me their priorities as relates to the goals that they've agreed to take on or been assigned. If it's not, it's not an agreement, 1099 W2. And then I ask, very simple, 11 year old could do this if they just held to it. How do you, what were your results last week? What did you accomplish? How do you feel about that? Depending on whether they won or lost, Based on that, is there anything that you would do differently? Great. Now let's talk about your priorities this week. If they need coaching, there's another one in there. Like, do you need help? Do we need to assign another team member? Is this bigger than we imagined? But we look at last week, and then we forecast what they're going to do the next week. Next week, I pull out their 411. I'm looking back. Then we're looking forward. Just a rhythm. It takes about 30 minutes. And we have clarity. And I can tell you, because I have a coach that does this to me. I send him my 411. We meet every other week. He sees what I'm committing to. And I'll tell you, it absolutely makes you more likely to do it when someone's watching. As a business owner, we can rationalize my kid was sick, whatever. This one person is looking at it from the lens of results gained. And it doesn't mean we're inhuman. Like if your kid's sick, your one thing is to go home and take care of that kid. But we now have to adjust. Now we have to say no to other things to make our number one happen. I'll start canceling appointments. I don't know. Have we rescheduled this podcast a few times? I don't think so. That's a first. It <laughs> almost always. Like I, I try to have at least one promotional thing for our books every single week. Yeah. But 
if I have to write with Gary, we had a huge event this week, that's going to take priority. And so I didn't get that one podcast that week. Well, the next week, I'm going to say I'm going to get two. And that's how we catch up. And that's how we do the accountability dance. And last thing on accountability, because we're adults, nobody likes the idea of being held accountable. And I use that language and it's in error. We choose to be accountable to our goals. And there's someone who witnesses it, encourages us. Like my coach is not trying to catch me being wrong. He literally will text me sometimes the day before and say, I know you had a, a big goal this week. How is it going? And I asked him, it's like, it's pretty, maybe every other week, every third week you text me, why is that? He goes, because I know people get distracted and I know in 24 hours, a lot of times that's just enough time for people to win. And I want to celebrate the wins. Mm, love that. I, I love the focus on coaching and being held accountable. I love what you just said too, that we we choose to be held accountable. All right. Often as adults, we feel like, oh, I don't need that or I, yeah, whatever. We, we think we need to hold our kids accountable, right? But we don't need to be held accountable. Uh, I love that you're, well, you know, little you're choosing. Kids, we hold accountable. Like, no, you don't get to run with scissors, right? Like they're like, we That's have right. to keep them safe too. But um, yeah, yeah I, I, it's, it's, if you look at the words that we would describe a coaching relationship versus a manager, I don't want to be manager. I don't want to be managed. I like to be coached. Yes. It's a different relationship. And uh, I like it better. If so, if I have to manage someone, they're probably not going to last. If they aren't accountable, they're going to be gone. That's a yeah. non-negotiable for me. They have to be coachable and accountable. Um, and everybody is to a certain level in different areas of their life at different times. But that's non-negotiable to work on my team. You know, let's, I guess, transition a little bit here, but on the same thought, yeah. you know, as, as we think through this and staying focused and but still scaling, right? Uh, you yeah. and I were talking about before we record started recording a little bit about how things change or scaling habits, culture, and leadership. The, you know, let's dive in there a little bit. As you have scaled, how have you stayed focused? What's changed in those those things we mentioned? So um, for about, gosh, 15 years, I've been pretty clear. My number one role is content creation. All of my success comes from my content creation. And if I'm not doing it, something's off because that is also my calling. I really enjoy, I can make an impact, the biggest possible impact by creating courses and books. And now my reach is extended. I mean, theoretically, someone could be reading this book a hundred years from now. I'll never meet them. I'll never know what their results are, but that's the magnifier. So I'm very clear. And this is now maybe going down the wormhole a little bit because I'm a creative. I hold myself accountable to reading a book every week, right? I know that your outputs are determined by your inputs, right? I hold myself accountable as a business person to making one new relationship every week. My, my wife, who's in sales, laughs at that. Like, are you kidding me? And I was like, yeah, but I'm not in sales, technically. But I know that if I add one talented individual to my database every week, over time, and I've been doing this for a decade, you end up with a golden Rolodex, right? Your database is just loaded with people who either might want to work with you, for you, or know someone who will, right? And you just, I just try to build one new relationship every single week. Usually do that with a coffee meeting. I've got my writing days that I track. And one of the other things my coach holds me accountable to, once the book is out in the world, what are you doing to support it? in the form of teaching publicly, a keynote, a podcast. And every coach I've had, I said, these are my four non-negotiables. You're going to find every single week when you ask, how did they go? You're going to see that I do them because they're very habitual. But if you don't ask me, I will fire you. I'm paying for the coaching call. These are my goals. I'm very, very clear. They can coach me around them, but they have to ask me about them. If they fall into the habit of not doing it, I call them out on it. And they'll say, but you do it every week. And I said, yes, but you ask me every week. Therefore, I do it. Do not give me space to start cheating on my dreams. So I don't even know where I started because I'm so passionate about that clarity. <laughs> like I know, yeah. and they're unique for everyone, right? I know people that all they have to do to be one of the top salespeople in the world is have about 10 to 20 conversations a day. And they build their morning out to make that happen. Gary's first assistant, his first piece of leverage in his business, her number, she was a college student. 
her number one job was to look at his database and say, here are the 10 calls you have to make today and why. Right? That's it. Take all the friction out of the number one activity and make it happen. So scaling is almost always around your habits. And sometimes those habits hit a wall. I shared with you, I had a, a SWAT team of creatives, very accountable. We were running great. We had a transition in leadership. I inherited three new departments. I came back from a two-week absence. I had a major back surgery. I was operating at half speed, and I went from like 10 to 44 employees. And all of my systems broke. Because suddenly, until I could figure out who my leaders were, I had not five direct reports, I had 12. Now, almost two days were filled up with me assessing people and holding them accountable and meeting with them and trying to digest all of their stuff. And all of my systems broke. And it took me a whole summer to re-engineer the models that I lived my leadership through to be bigger enough to handle that. I'll tell you the one thing that I don't play with. If you're going to have a high quality mentee coaching relationship, somewhere around seven, I can't do it anymore. So I need to have a limited number of leaders and I will move the organization around so that they're getting a chance to lead other people so that I can actually know enough about their personal and professional lives to give them quality coaching. Love that. Uh, and caring for, for those that report to you in that way as well. Uh, and I meant to say, I love the focus on the personal life as, uh, also, and at least asking yeah. about it. I try to do that on a monthly basis too, as we have a, I call it an alignment meeting, you know, with each team yeah. member. And, and I often will say, you know, well, let's talk about some personal goals. And I, I will try to say, oh, you know, you don't have to tell me, but I would love to at least hold you accountable or ask about it next time. Right. And, yeah. and uh, I agree. It's like uh, the things you can know about, Hey, what's happening at home is so important to uh, transitioning to what's happening at work. Right. As well, but how we can care for them, how we can really love them, you know, even in their yeah. home life or marriage or whatever it may be. Uh, you spoke about, you know, habits and some leadership as uh, changes as you scaled and a lot more employees, whatnot. What about the culture? You know, how did that change? Uh, and how do you speak, you know, just how do you scale it and and, uh, and think through? I mean, the culture is so important, uh, right? Yeah. Uh, and so speak to that. So um, I think you have to have, uh, we call it an MVVPP, Mission, Vision, Values, Beliefs, Perspective. The perspective is like, how are we doing? But the first part is really clear. Mission is where are we going? Vision, what does it look like along the way and when we get there, right? As a leader, that's what you're using to attract people. You want people that buy it. They may not have their own mission, but they're willing to buy into yours. Um, you have vision, values, and beliefs are like, what are the things that we value as an organization, right? For us, it was like God, family, business. And like, we wanted to have them in that order. Um, God, as we become a worldwide company, has taken on a much bigger meaning, right? It's not just like we started with Christian leadership, but now we're all over the world. And we just want to honor the fact that that relationship is often the number one relationship in people's lives. And we as a company will try to honor that, right? We don't ever schedule our big events over the Jewish holidays and things like that. We try to make sure that people don't have to make hard choices. Um, we This last week, we had our mid-year convention and the Austin AISD moved their start date after we had booked the venue. So there were people, we probably had about a thousand less than we would normally have. We had 4,700, normally we'd have a little bit more and they were choosing to see their kids off to their first day of school. And I honor that choice, right? And we were like, we can't forecast those things. We have to book these venues sometimes seven years out. I don't know when school starts seven years from now, but we have windows that we try to honor those things. So we have our values and then beliefs. We call them the Y4C two T's. It's a mouthful, but it's like win, win, no deal, integrity in all things. Like, and those become the rules that we live by. So I believe they have to be genuine. They don't just, they should align with the leader, but they often come from your core group. Gary met, um, this is a long story, in the 80s, he was a traditional real estate company. Remax came to down and the savings and loan bust happened. And overnight, the board in Austin went from 5,000 to 2,000 realtors and over half of his agents left for Remax. He pulled in the people who stayed with him and asked the question, why did you stay? And he wrote it all on flip charts and he came back the next day and said, I think I heard these things. 
that we're win-win, that we believe in integrity, right? That the customer comes first, that we succeed through others. Did I get it right? And they worked on it together. Because a lot of times those things are hollow, right? They're a projection. And, um, but because it was sourced from the group, and my friend, um, Josh Dorkin, went through a similar phase with Bigger Pockets when he was building it. He put out his mission and values and stuff. And he just said, like, it was on the wall. It looked pretty. But then he pulled his top people together and they wrote it together. And then it started coming alive. Um, one more thing on culture. My first, we call it family reunion, right? God Family Business is our annual convention. It's a family reunion. Um, my son, I've been going to these for 24 years. I remember when he was like 11, he asked, Dad, when will I be old enough to go to our family reunion? And I realized he thought it was an actual family reunion. <laughs> I was like, oh, gosh, no, I'm so sorry. It's a work event. You don't want to go to this. Not till you're much older. Um, culture happens in person. It is. it is. I know that there are tech teams that have built amazing cultures virtually, but all of the leaders I know that run virtual businesses bring their team together two to three times a year. And working together in person where the values are on full display um, often is where it gets cemented. So we use events. We're so big now. That is our anchor point for our culture. And we try to make sure there are cultural moments at every single event where people get to reaffirm and reestablish that that's why I'm with this company, right? So I could go way deep down that wormhole. My first family reunion was 2,000 people. I was like, this is the biggest event I've ever been to. Last year, we had 18,000. But people would say it's the best ever, and it still had that cultural vibe because we were intentional. Yes, we want to educate you. Yes, there's an entertainment, and we did it in Vegas so they could have fun. But we are non-negotiable on the cultural elements of coming together. Love that. I uh, love the focus of coming together. Our team has been asking for that more often. We're all virtual all over the place. You know, It's expensive for a small organization. Is, like, How is. do you engineer it, even if it's just a few at a time, to work together and really, I mean, that's just where the magic happens. You yeah. know, when do you get to ask about the kids or what you did the weekend? Like we do some of that on our virtual huddles, yeah, but it's not the same as right. like driving in the car to a restaurant for lunch and you just, conversations happen. You get to know each other on a deeper level. So uh, I, that's my bias, by the way. I don't know that it's a fact. I think there's research to support it, but that's what's worked for us. I will give that one qualification couple more thoughts I want to ask you about, Jay, before we run out of time. <clears throat> and, you know, well, one thing- Time is flying, Whitney. Thank it, you. It is. It is flying by. Uh, you, before we started recording, you also mentioned the question of what is best, what, what is the best, biggest model I can follow for this? Yeah. Uh, and I wanted you to be able to, I wanted you to be able to talk about that because I, I want to be able to think about that. I almost want to put it on my wall so I can like be- looking at that as I'm thinking about different things, right? Or asking yeah. myself about different routes to go or whatnot. But I wanted you to be able to think through or talk, help us to think through, uh, you know, thinking through that question, right? Uh, and yeah. how that's helped you. Have you ever had a golf lesson? I'm not a golfer. But have you ever gone to like a I range have or- yes. Yeah. Has someone showed you how to hold a club, right? Yes. Is it natural at all? I don't think it's natural. No, no, like you'd want to hold like a baseball bat, right? right? You have to like loop your pinky over this finger, like thumbs, the model. With it, yeah. yeah, the model for success. And I'm not, I'm not much of a golfer either. My dad was, but I remember him trying to teach me. And I was like, this is so unnatural. So often models are things that are not natural. Mm -hmm. we, we say your entrepreneurial is you're reaching your natural ceiling of achievement. When you adopt a bigger model, purposely, you get to break through that ceiling of achievement. Everything has a model and there are big ones and small ones. If you want to find the biggest models for the things you're curious about, hey, how does someone triage all the inboxes in their life, right? I've got LinkedIn, I've got DMs and opportunities coming from Instagram or Facebook, and then I've got my email inbox. Like I've got all of these mailboxes to check if my mind's blowing up. And then I've got all the text messages. You want to find a model for that? Go talk to the people who get 500 texts a day. Go talk to the people that have hundreds of thousands of followers and say, what's your system? 
and then say, now, based on that model, because they had to do it to be successful, they had to break through and find a bigger model. And not all of them did, by the way. But if you ask enough people, you'll see a common thread. So our whole research method, it's how we spent four and a half years researching the one thing. We interviewed people in the top 1%, companies in the top 1%. We profiled artists, athletes, you name it. And we're looking for the common thread. If I want to successfully summit Everest, I'm going to study as many people as I can that did it. And then I'm going to ask, what did they all have in common? And the things they all have in common to achieve that very specific thing often is the model. Now, you might have some special sauce, right? You used to be in the military. You were in law enforcement. Maybe you start off with a much higher level of cardio fitness than the average person. So your model might not work for me. So, uh, But I look across it, you're going to start to see a pattern. And those patterns are usually there. A lot of them are in books, the cheapest educators you can find. But you have to be reading and looking for the model. Like I used to love the Tim Ferriss podcast because one of his questions, because he's a model builder, we've gotten to interview him. He's a model builder. He often would ask, what's your morning routine? Because he had seen a pattern that the most successful people in the world started their day different than other people. There's even some pseudo research from a guy who was a CPA. He would survey his clients and he found that high net worth individuals tended to get up three hours before they had to be at work. And I know a lot of people who show up at work with their hair still wet from the shower. I'm usually up at about 530. I was doing it already. So I felt like pat myself on the back. We're doing good. But I was like, yeah. But Tim Ferriss was asking, what are you doing? And people get up and they have their rituals. They hydrate. They might meditate. They might journal. They work out. They, They fill some of the buckets that fill them up for their day. And that's why in the back of all of our big books, The Millionaire Real Estate Investor, The Millionaire Real Estate Agent, the one thing, one of the last things, and it's a test, like, what did you think of the energy plan? There in the back, that's almost always the stuff that we do before 8 a.m. And for me, and the one thing, every single morning, I want to look at my goals in my calendar. I want to know before I get in the work environment, before I get into my email, What were the priorities I set before myself before I get lost in other people's priorities? Because if I know what I've said yes to, guess what? It's easier saying no to the other junk because I'm clear. It's like, oh, I'm sorry. I've already made a commitment today. I don't usually clarify what the commitment is. I'm sorry. I've already got another commitment. Can we do it later? And we strive to have a great day before noon. And then the rest of the day, you can be a lot less disciplined. Incredible, man. I, I, and I want to get to one other thing, Jay. Uh, you, I loved how you mentioned the focus on God, family, business, and scaling like you all have. No doubt, it's so easy for all of us. I talk about this often on the show because I have also have a, a major focus on family. I, I want to be as successful at the dining room table as I am at the boardroom table, right? And, yeah. and I want to help other people to do that exact same thing, other men. And, and, uh, and so, Speak to how you've done that, you know, as you've scaled, as you've, you know, you're, you've got this level of focus in the business and you got all these people pulling at you constantly, but we don't want to miss out on like what's most important over here as well. Right. And, well, and well, like every parent, right. You stare at the yeah. ceiling some nights thinking I failed, I failed them. I failed them. Right. Especially once you have teenagers. So that's just normal. <laughs> right. Um, we were a little bit purposeful about this. Gary was a good mentor. You know, he was about, 10, 15 years ahead of me with his son. And he was very open about sharing the lessons. Um, My coach did a training recently and I often don't get to sit in on a webinar. My day is too busy. But the line that struck me, he was interviewing a woman who chose to step back from a huge leadership opportunity because she realized this was the last summer she was going to spend with her oldest child. And she didn't want to miss a single track meet. She wanted to be there in the stands. And Jordan said, being present is different than being energetically present. And you made the decision to be energetically present versus just there. And there's a massive difference. When you have really small kids, they know when you're not focused, just like the dog. They'll start batting you like you're not scratching me very well. You need to focus on what you're doing, right? So energetically present. And then he added this line and it, 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 it cut. 
He goes, we all want to be an example to our kids, not a warning. And I wrote that one down and put it in my environment as a source of accountability for me. What am I role modeling when I'm not even interacting with them? So we tried to build habits that like my son, when I left the house, he's on a summer break after his first year of college, he's working in our construction business and he had scheduled time with the trainer. He was going to work out. And I was like, yay. And he's working out in the morning. That's a habit that is sustainable, right? Even when you have small kids, you can get up before them and work out. Going to the gym at nine is not a big habit. It might, if you're a professional athlete, there are times when you should be working out that are probably not early in the morning. There's all the cortisol, but like for the rest of us, you do it when you know you'll do it on repeat. We had a rule. No devices at the table, no TV, except for one night, Friday nights. So every night we had dinner at the table. There was all kinds of research that when you had dinner as a family, your kids had lower instances of alcohol and drug abuse. They had higher self-esteem. Like you just go through it, lower instance depression. Why? Because you had to actually talk, right? Um, they get to hear your life story. They get to understand it. The longest health study ever, the Harvard study, they narrowed it down. And there's this thing called the do you know test. They asked children, do you know how your parents met? Do you know, like a series of 25 questions and the ones that answered yes more were highly likely to have more agency, all the good things. So just a little bit of time. And I'll tell you, it's tough with teenagers. How was your day? Fine. What did you do? Nothing, right? But over time, the conversations have a better chance to happen, right? And um, the other thing we did is, and, the, and this is kind of it, right? Other than, you know, I'll give you one more rule that we created. We tried to keep it simple. Every time we sat down at the table, we asked one thing that they were grateful for that day. And it was kind of funny. Like for years, my son, it was his Xbox, right? And I'm fine with that. But at least I know, like, that's his favorite thing. Like, he loves to play games with his friends. Awesome. We'll put some boundaries around that. But for the most part, we know that that's, that's the thing where he's connecting with his friends. You get insights. And the last bit was a later edition. I can't remember when Grit came out, Angela Duckworth's book. But I got to interview her, and we became friends because the chapter at the very end that most people don't read is, read is called Parenting for Grit. This idea of perseverance and the power of doing something long after most people quit is the number one determinant of success in so many areas. I said, how do you parent for that? And she goes, we have a hard thing rule. Everybody in the family has to have a hard thing. They get to choose, but they don't get to quit. And she just used, there's the spring semester, the fall semester, and the summer. What's your hard thing? We let them choose. Going to art class, great. Well, you're not going to miss an art class unless you're sick. You're going to play on the rowing team. Gus was a rower for five years. He practiced three hours, five times a week. Rowing is brutal, but he didn't quit. In his senior year, he said, I think my one thing, my hard thing has got to be to apply for college and prepare for that. And I'm not sure I can do that in row. He goes, but I loved his thought process. He came to us and he said, I'm going to give it two months and I'm going to see if I can do both. And if I can't, I've talked to my coach, I'm going to step back from the team. And he cried when he did, but he did. And then he got into a very good school at the end of the year. But I don't think it would have happened if he hadn't made that choice. So the hard thing, teaching them to stick when they want to quit is a great parenting trick. So there's some ideas for you. If I could only do one of those, I would have dinner. If I could only do two, I would ask for gratitude. And then you can play from there. Such great advice, Jay. So grateful uh, to learn from men like yourself who have been leading a family while trying to scale and have scaled a business successfully. Because uh, I, I don't want to lose focus on the most important things, right? I, I tell myself and others all the time, hey, I would give the business up. I would give all the scaling up if I knew hey, later it would cost my marriage, right? Or a relationship with kids, right? I, I would just, hey, <laughs> I give all that away. <laughs> But, but we I, justify the work by saying we're doing it for them. That's right. That's right. And you can't get a third grader's birthday party back. That's right. 
right? You don't get to play God and think that they're going to want to hang out from you 10 years from now when you've done the thing. You have to attend to those things along the way. Even if it slows things down, it's the right move to make. Mm. So well said. Very last question, Jay, how do you like to give back? Uh, my wife and I set charity goals every year. Um, we do a thing called a goal setting retreat. Um, this year, actually in November, so this might come out afterwards, will be our last goal setting retreat here in Austin. We're going to, it's going to change, but we've been doing it for 18 years and we set goals for our finances, for our kids. We just ask, what are the big goals? We set five-year goals. And then we ask, what are we going to do this year based on that? And that just like a business team doing a retreat, like we did that for our family. And I don't know when I'm going to look it up. So pardon me, I've, I've got a, a spreadsheet because I'm a nerd. What's the first tab? We started tracking, tracking in 2018, but we've been doing it for a few years before that. We started setting a charity goal and we set it in three areas. Where will we give our time? Where will we give our money? And where will we raise money? And over time, those have grown with our lives. Like, uh, I think for the last couple of years, our giving goal has been about 150. And, but we raise often 700 to 800,000 through the charities that we support and sit on the boards. And then we also give time through serving on those boards. And so like when you don't have money, you can give your time. Um, when you have a little bit of time and still don't have money, you can support the organization and use your influence to raise money for it. And I think people over-index on the writing of checks, which is very gratifying in itself, but the other things are just as valuable. So we, we set some goals around there and uh, that's fun. It's actually like, that's why we're working today. If you manage your finances right and you buy assets that pay you over time, like a lot of your listeners, coach their clients to do it too. At some point, you will have more than enough. And chasing a number is just moving the goalpost. How we move through that is like, we ask the question, what would it look like if we could give away a million dollars a year someday? How big would we have to be to feel like that was something that we were entitled to do? So we set as big a goals, just like everywhere else. You stretch yourself by setting stretch goals. Jay, I'm, I'm grateful for the intentionality behind giving as well. It's a great example for myself and the listeners. To, and I love the retreat with your wife, the goal setting retreat and how giving is a big part of that also. Yeah. Jay, uh, so many things you've said today. I, I, I want to go back and listen to this uh, myself again. And uh, it's so <laughs> good. Uh, and uh, yeah, I, I just, man, if we implemented, I think a third of what you said today, uh, our businesses would be in lives. Would here's be the question. Different. What's the one thing you should implement from this? And you're a lot more likely to do it. Yeah. Pick one thing, and I promise you, you'll be happy three months from now. That's incredible. Uh, I'm going to do it. <laughs> I, 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 I want to, yeah, I'm going to do it. I, I want to figure out what that is. And I, uh, man, I even helped my team to do it as well. Uh, Great. So, Great. I love that. So, Pass it so, on. Jay, how can the listeners get in touch with you and learn more about you? And obviously the one thing. So if they go to the one thing.com with the number one, um, we have all of our resources there. Um, we're building out more. I've, I, the, the company was about seven years old and we did a big pivot last year and we're kind of rebuilding the value proposition. Our core thing right now is around our community and our coaching. So like I have coaches, I, even though I got Gary Keller, like I want someone that is in my corner helping me achieve my goals. That's, I think we're pretty good at coaching people to live the kind of things that I'm talking about. You you were asking me, it hit me. You were asking me like, what's my one thing from this? Something that's really, you know, I, I didn't. I didn't mean to put you on the spot. I just said, pick one thing. And then I bet you'll a lot more likely to do it. But what I, I had written this down earlier, you've talked about the coaching so much. And for me personally, I've been in this process of looking for that next coach, that next, like leveling up, you know, and I think that's probably it uh, at the moment. I want Great. that. that coach, I hope you'll uh, give us an audition. I would love yeah, that. I would love that as well. I would love that as well. So Jay, grateful so much uh, to you uh, and your man, just desire to give back in this way. Uh, I hope the listeners will reach out to you and obviously get the book if you haven't already. I know it's on Audible. I listened to it probably five years ago, I think. Uh, mm. And so, so grateful. Uh, and so, man, thank you again. Thank you so much for having me and sharing me with your listeners. 